Bring it, yes. I screw up intros even when I'm not doing intros. That's how bad this is done. Welcome to Jazz. What a stupid this gimmick. This show about things and very bad intros. You would think that after three years you'd get better at these, but nah, we just get worse. Uh, it is, uh, I'm here with words uh, and people. Um, uh, three people, in fact, myself, uh, Jazz Sequence on the internet, uh, also, Gary, who is binary Gary on the internet, and Allison, who's Allison Plus on the internet. And the way that this usually works is somebody comes up with a topic, and the rest of us discuss the topic or what we think the topic might be. Uh, really, just an excuse to to hang out uh, for a little bit on a on on a regular basis. And sometimes there's there's a, a theme. Uh, you can contact us on the internets. Uh, our website is binaryjazz.us. There's a contact page. If you send us a thing or a topic or a question, we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz. Uh, and uh, uh, we really encourage that because we get lonely. It's, it's lonely up here at the top of a mountain of past episodes because we're not at the top of podcast ratings. <laughs> But you can relieve a review and we'll probably read that on the air too. Binary Do you get jazz. a notification for reviews? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I was looking at that uh, I would like to say yes, but I don't think that I do. I think Apple might, but I don't know. And they're Is not there telling you. Is yeah. there the possibility that we have like 30 reviews and we don't know about it? Oh, we don't. That. Yeah. We, we don't <laughs> in in other multiverses yes that is a possibility i left us a review hey have you have you all had problems no, with did. slack this morning i mean beyond the normal problems like with it delivering like content from perhaps january no no but it was having issues yesterday like noted issues yeah. through their thing so i don't know if that's carryover from that let, let me add a, a fun thing. Those issues yesterday were happening right as we were doing a company-wide um, user acceptance testing jam of a feature Ooh. I've been working on. Doesn't that sound fun? I mean, um, it sounds like my high school used to have something called mandatory fun, so it sounds kind of like that. <laughs> oh. Like actually, it was that was kind of fun. It was actually called mandatory fun. That wasn't just like a tongue-in-cheek thing that you called it like out of context no it was, yeah mandatory fun they really wanted to let you know that you would show up and it would be fun <laughs> that's, this like, mandatory. that's like yeah that's like the mandatory school rallies uh that we I were... think like i don't know like i don't know much about testing so it could very well be fun but from the outsider's perspective i'm like i don't know about this <laughs> it was so it's a feature i've been working on and uh you know, we've had like load tests and we've got automated tests and we've gone through like user stories and like, well, all right, let's put it in front of like actual humans because some of the functionality of this is like different humans interacting with the same thing, right? So it was helpful to have several humans fiddling with it um, and exposing were these people but it was also- External from that? the company or just other employees? It was pretty much the entire company yeah. was on the call, which sounds like, Exciting, but there's eight of us, so. I was gonna say, I was just like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, the entire company hopped on and tested this feature and it failed in some spectacular ways I didn't uh, expect. Uh, that part wasn't as fun, but honestly, it still kind of was fun because like, I mean, had we not done that, we might've been confident in all the other tests we've done and shipped it and then been like, oh, well, that's a crappy user experience, mm -hmm. so. Anyway, I uh, am I supposed to just tell what the topic is now? Uh, if we run out of things, to, yeah. If we run into things to talk about and there's a lull in the conversation and you have a topic, usually that's the oh, appropriate time to uh, drop your topic. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by the Zen Hub board. I'm going to put it away, so I'm not looking at it. <laughs> yeah, um, Allison um, has volleyed and said, "Hey, someone else can take a topic today," and. Uh, I happen to be it the first like person in Slack. Through, you went through a few different ones, similar no, just to two. The, Allison, the Allison process of iteration. At last minute, the you were first like, I got one. one. 
The first one I was super excited about. And then when researching the first one, I ran into another one. And then I realized when I looked up and had like six tabs open and was like taking notes and had a calculator <laughs> open. And I was like, perhaps <laughs> this is the topic. <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. So there's clues, I guess. I'm not good at bringing an anonymous topic because I started with clues. The topic is equal temperament. Equal temperament. I think that, equal, would you like me to spell it, Chris? I think equal no. temperament is something that I do not have. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's when you have like twins and they're both like, like the same, they have the kidding. same... Like the same like moods at the same time, right? Like they're equal temperament. They have the equal temperament. Like they both get angry at the same time. They yeah. both, both get frustrated at the same time. They get sad at the same time. Uh, that's that's equal temperament. It's equal. I uh, I like that answer. <laughs> it is wrong, but I like it. Oh crap! Equal we are on one of those episodes where I need to do a one and a bunch of zeros. How many zeros do you ask? I think seven. No, nope, I didn't. I think equal <laughs> temperament is something you do when you're baking a cake and you have to temper the sugar. <laughs> oh, the sugar's not equally tempered. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap, that's a big number. Nope. Well, it looks like a big number, but it's- And if it's too it tempered, then it's just number. right out. Like. Yeah. Yeah, chuck it and start over. It's yeah, over tempered. To, yeah, it's too late. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> but now I just the want cake. I, so. The thing I like about this this word is that it's two or this phrase is it's two words we're like intimately familiar with, and so it. But together they it's mean very like, similar to. I mean, it's very easy to make assumptions about what it isn't. Yeah. But if it's yeah, there's not a lot of context. But the context is Gary, so. <laughs> so it probably has to do with space. Space or music, mm. um, or even food. To be honest, that's why I went the cake route. But I ooh, but ooh, actually, while we're talking about food, <laughs> while we're talking about food, I uh, I decided to use the uh, instant pot again this past Sunday. Uh, I did go with meat because someone was like, "Oh, what, I guess were we chatting last week and we yeah. talked about meat?" Yes, yeah. we talked about my bizarre light bulbs, the quantity of crock pots we own, and mm -hmm. what an instant pot is good for, and meat. So I did a uh, pot roast, which, um, uh, wrong crack, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, but now I'm thinking like, an Oz about a pot roast from I know, us, right? I know, it's fine. No, I don't need it. I don't need it. I, I enjoyed it for lunch for like three days. Um, but, but now I'm thinking about this coming weekend. Like I'm like, well, gosh, what, what's the next thing I can do on Sunday? Because my Sunday jam is now becoming like Gary dances with the instant pot. Is pot um, roast different than ribs? Yeah. Such a vegetarian question to ask. It's a different yeah. part, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> same the, animal, the, probably. The, could could the be same roast, animal. Could be a different animal. The pot roast is the pot part of the animal. Right. right. Like and here. Then, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the <laughs> ribs are obviously the ribs. Yeah. Um. But so I'm trying to think like what I can do this weekend, and uh, for what it's worth, um, I like potatoes, carrots, and onions. I added, so I did the pot roast and it took, I don't know, like time. But then I, I knew I needed to add vegetables. If I add them too early, they were just gonna be like, they weren't actually gonna be vegetables if they sat in there for an hour mm -hmm. with this meat. Yeah. Like they were gonna be like paste, which doesn't sound appetizing. Maybe I'll do something with vegetable paste this weekend. I'm gonna Google that after the show. Um, so I put them in for three minutes and had a, 10 minute uh, like depressurization, natural depressurization and then the quick depressurizing. And, um, and it, was, it was like 30 seconds too short on the carrots. Like they had just a little too much bite. Onions, beautiful. Potatoes, like gorgeous. Carrots were a little, maybe I should just cut them into smaller pieces. That's the answer. I like, I like substantial carrots. It's a good band name. Substantial carrots. Oh. So is equal <laughs> temperament. Um, uh, talking about paste. I think um, 
we've been trying to find a uh, good crock pot recipes for like like indian curries because the way that those are traditionally made is like stuff sits in a pot for like eight hours which is essentially a crock pot i mean not that's, that's not what they use yeah. but that's essentially what they're doing they just like they cook the, the the vegetables until they're no longer identifiable as vegetables and then you eat it yeah um uh and so i would that that's a thing that's a thing if you, i would not necessarily search for vegetable paste but if i just did could, pretty <laughs> disappointed Close that tab. probably you could probably find uh relevant vegetable uh dishes that are instapot that are uh Indian, possibly. That said, mm -hmm. I, I was... haven't really found any good Indian crockpot recipes yet, which is really kind of disappointing. Oh, because that's, um... that's like how it's made. Like, it's, you should be able to get something that's closer to authentic. We have all the spices too. Like, we go to the Indian market. <laughs> You're uh, like, we're so genuine. <laughs> I know. We, we've got like we've got this, we've got the tools. We don't have a crockpot, but we, yeah, we don't make it like in a slow simmer, basically. But it turns out okay. But like most of our recipes are from a book called Indianish. And hmm. so like it's specifically for I think people like us who are like adapting with what we have mm -hmm. on hand. Um, but it always works out. I don't know. I mean, I'm still like going to go out and get actual Indian food from somewhere yeah. <laughs> as well. Like I don't think that my Indian food is ever a substitute. <laughs> yeah. And that's what equal temperament is. Yes. <laughs> what yes, the acknowledgement that what you make will not be as good as the Indian food outside. <laughs> being equal tempered about about your food mm -hmm. as compared to uh, other people's food. Actually, honestly, with a few exceptions, I mean, mm -hmm. like 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 ethnic foods, I would say that our food is as good as what we would get elsewhere. But like, certainly, if you're going to like a Thai place or an Indian place or uh, another particularly like a, this type of food our stuff doesn't really match boy i want thai tonight you know what you should make is barbecue sauce homemade barbecue sauce is like oh and you can put that on it almost anything <laughs> yeah like you could, well, you could do tofu or you could do ribs <laughs> yeah 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 we did uh we did chili last night um and katie's like ambivalent about chili like are you kidding like it's like it's a canvas like you can add whatever you want on top of this you know like, it's like a, it's like a potato. the star isn't the potato the star is like the stuff that you put on it <laughs> but it, but that's the thing like chili like sometimes can be the star like if it's good chili like but if you're, you're like oh I'm not really feeling this chili great hide it with something else you're not gonna hurt anyone's feelings like that's like the legit thing about chili you know so we don't make it very spicy because spicy food is, is problematic in our house. Um, but so like I, I take my, uh, my uh, smoked ghost chilies and grind them in there and now it's spicy for me and I want more chili pepper or powder. Great, fine, do it. Throw my cornbread in there, you know? I wanna throw some sour cream on mine. Let her rip. I'm not a huge chili fan. You had my chili when we were at that no, you didn't. You didn't. That was the that was the word camp that you that was pre Allison. Pre Allison. Had, what? If, what a world. <laughs> if, if if you had had if you had had my chili, then you might you might like. I think differently. Okay, maybe. I think the problem yeah, is maybe I just have had subpar. I don't know. Like it's just like a lot of the same. That yeah. yeah. That that retreat there was a chili cook off, and being the resident vegetarian, mine was the only vegetarian chili. I think. I think Lisa made one uh, that was vegetarian, but it's, but like for everyone else, cause she did too, I think um, for everyone else, their chili is like, I mean, frequently chili, I guess for other people is like beans and meat. And like, that's the yeah. whole thing. And that's not chili to me. Like chili is like beans and a bunch of stuff. Cause beans that's the more thing. Beans. <laughs> different yeah. types did you did i tell you about the uh the chili cook-off the cub scout chili cook-off why are chili cook-offs such a big deal i've never I like i don't know um i guess the, there's a so lot of different the... ways to interpret it because i do think that that chili 
uh, my chili soapbox is that chili should be more than just like one ingredient. Like it shouldn't just be beans and meat and like, I don't know, tomato paste, I guess is what you put in it. I don't, we don't put yeah. tomato paste because we put fucking tomatoes in our chili. Like, <laughs> <laughs> tomatoes <laughs> not beef steak and like tomatoes. actual like vegetables like yeah in the, in the chili temperament about chili <laughs> no i'm very so, not so here's not here's the cub scout chili cook-off story and and i i will start by saying like this is all ronda because i wasn't really you know jamming on chili or much in the kitchen besides grilled cheese sandwiches so like all the leaders in this in this pack are supposed to be like this chili cook-off thing or i guess it was the district and so like 12 chilies were entered Mm-hmm. And so the deal was like, you got like a little cup yep. and then you went and you tasted every chili and then you like voted. Well, first off 12 chilies, like at some point, like seven of them are actually the same chili. Like <laughs> there's no, there's nothing, but like, so scouts. So like one of them was like, Oh, this has sirloin in it instead of ground beef. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then there was the one that was like ridiculously hot, like inedible hot. Okay. That's a gimmick. And then there were a lot that were like, Okay. And then Rhonda made this chili and she was like, I don't want to do something like everyone else is doing. So she made this like, she just improv like a Thai chili. Hmm. So it was like, it had like some curry flavorings going on. Um, it had black beans, which was like, a I don't, I think one of the chili had black. It was like totally, like it looked like chili and it sort of had influence of chili because there was some tomato and some other stuff going on, but it was not like a conventional, you know, chili. Uh, and next to it, she had like um, little crunchy, uh, what are those little crunchy noodles? Um, I don't know, to throw on top as a garnish and and lime to like squeeze on top. That was it. And so like, it was like all these, like if you Googled chili, like 11 of them were exactly what you would get as a first result. And then there was this like totally bizarre one, like stuck in the middle of like number seven or whatever. And uh, so and they go through and they're like awards, Oh and my God, not because, even close. Yeah, because she was yes. a different one. And it was like hottest, like obviously the one that no one could eat. Like everyone took like one bite and they were like, oh, that's that's a pretty warm chili. Because it's Cub Scouts and everyone has to be like, a, so dumb. And then one was like, I don't know. And then like the best chili, it was like with like 90% of the votes or something was hers. It was fantastic. Uh, and she's like, I don't actually know how I made it. Like I just kept throwing crap in the crock pot until it tasted right. <laughs> She's like I can never recreate it. <laughs> yes, I'm like make more of that. She's like I can't. Damn, it's a one time deal. <laughs> it was. It was a magical chili, and she won like a little wooden spoon with like the pack logo wood burned into it. Very. I mean, if you were going to give like a like a prize for a Cub Scout chili cook off, that's the prize you should give. You know. You know Go ahead, Allison. Oh, Um, no, I was just like, you know what it is? You know why in my head I'm like, I don't like chili? It's because my mom always makes it in a crock pot when I visit them in mm. Colorado. And I always get sick the first night I'm there, not because of the chili, but because of the altitude. And that's why I don't like chili. It's all coming together in my brain now. It's probably nothing. Yeah. So wooden spoon. (laughs) Yes. Uh, You know, wooden spoon is the award given to the team or a fake award, not an actual award, but the award given to the, the soccer team or football team with the worst record. Oh, the wooden spoon. I thought you were gonna say with the uh, most equal temperament. So, uh, so receiving a wooden spoon as a prize could be good, could be bad, depending on the context. Hmm. (laughs) That's funny. That's funny. Um, I think that's right. I'm, I'm probably bullshitting. It is, it is a thing. Is, like, no, is leave it. Just leave it where it is. Yeah. Leave it where it is. You don't have to correct. It's fine. Bullshit. <laughs> it's kind of the show. It's kind of how we roll. And anyway, is, I'm going to vote the chili. Equal after temperament. Call. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like I feel like even temperament or equal. Equal temperament. Cool. I yeah. think it's when you're constructing a house, mm. and you need to make sure the stairs are even. <laughs> Sure. Now I think I'm spelling it wrong. Temperament. T M P E R A M E N T. Okay. That's correct. Because I spelled yep. it without the A, but that's just my bad spelling. <laughs> Temper. Yeah. Ment. Yeah. But no, I get tem- it. But it's temperament. Temperament. <laughs> yeah. Which, if there was a U in there, that would be about uh, breaded vegetables. 
<laughs> equal what a tem- delicious temperament. It's, like, it's, it's like a group. <laughs> it's an equal temperament. It's when all of your vegetables are equally tempered. Yeah, uh, and they're all lot, of and, sweet potatoes, and they're all of equivalent size. Because you know, like with tempura, you always get like the really huge thing, and then you get the tiny, tiny little onion things. Like it needs to be like, I mean, I'm fine with the tiny, tiny onion things. I don't want a big chunk of onion, but you know, like they should be. There should be like a, a, a an even distribution of 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 tempura vegetables instead of like here's a big chunk of sweet potato that didn't get cooked all the way. We definitely always pivot to food. I think we're always too hungry. (laughs) Yeah. I had a good breakfast. I had a, uh, I had a a piece of French toast. I need to, I need to up my breakfast game. It's not like a breakfast when I say it that way, does it? (laughs) Breakfast, breakfast has always been a struggle because I'm just not hungry in the morning. Yeah. And I know I need like the brain power because if I don't eat breakfast and listen to that instinct, then by this time, I'm like out of my mind, but um, I'm kind of out of my mind anyway. So maybe, I don't know. Breakfast is just so not exciting. Like I eat mm. cereal, I eat, what, what am I eating? Like it's, just, we're not I doing eggs grocery anymore. store. Uh, and they have those like little plastic omelet makers that you like, oh. the promise is like you put eggs in and you put in your microwave for 30 seconds and you throw your ingredients and you fold it over and then the picture is this beautiful omelet and i'm like oh hell yeah i can rock an omelet in the morning and it was like six bucks and i've seen this thing like hanging in this grocery store since we moved here which means which probably should have been an indication right also like the sales (laughs) there were a a lot of red flags that i ignored along the route here uh and i guess you can see where it's going because i got the thing and the first day i'm like all right so i did the eggs the mixture i followed the instructions and it's like it's got the Chinglish going on in the instructions. So I'm like, uh, I think I understand, which also another red flag. I think we're at least three or four at the moment, uh, but but I plowed forward. And so I did it and I had some onions to throw into it and some cheese and what else? Um, oh, I believe I had tomato. I'm gonna put it in there and I did the flip thing and it's like, put it in for 30 more seconds, leave it be, open it. You're gonna have this beautiful omelet. And I did that and I opened it and I took a bite and went through the damn thing with the trash can because it was the grossest omelet I've ever had. It was like, it was, it, it was, it was overcooked. It was, no, it was overcooked. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was rubber. I mean, I basically created a pencil eraser with, with uh, tomatoes, onions, and cheese. Um, and, uh, and like, like the, you need to flavor the omelet in some way. Like part of that is when you put it in the pan with the butter or whatever you use, there's something that causes a flavor effect. Uh, which does not happen with just plastic, egg against plastic, apparently. So even in addition to it being rubbery, it tasted like I would have had the same reaction if I just looked the outside of the egg, like whatever, like it was not good. Uh, so I wasted the cheese and onion and tomato and the egg. And the thing still lives in our house. I don't know why I didn't throw it away. I should have just chucked it, but I'm like, ah, throw it in the back of the shelf. That's yeah, I'm no. Donate no. it to a, a, a greater cause. Yeah. I don't want to punish someone. <laughs> I wonder if you could use it for anything else. Mm, use it as a. Is I, it is it actually plastic or is it silicone? No, it's actually plastic. It's well, I don't know. It's like it's a plastic, like BPA free. All I mean, it's it's okay. It's probably plastic. It contains the next chemical that we haven't found yet that causes cancer when you eat it. That's yeah. that's <laughs> the plastic that it is. So I'm I'm impressed by your bravery because I'm picky about omelets on the best of days. So I would never assume my microwave could make one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Another red flag right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm yeah. Th- this was not my best work. Um, it's just fine. It's fine. I, I want to try. Like I, it was bad enough that like I'm like, well, I want to try it again. But I actually don't. That experience was so bad. I can't imagine like if I cut back the time or figured out a way to like flavor it, that it would ever come out in a way that I could enjoy it. Like it was so bad that I'm, it was not um, could recoverable. You circumvent this by just making a real omelet, creating more time well, to do that. Most certainly I could. Uh, I don't know. I mean, even so my homemade good. omelet wouldn't be great, but it'd be way better than that thing. Yeah. And, um, but, but also part of that would be um, like the point of this was like, I can make an omelet in three minutes, right? Like that's cool. That feels like the future. That was probably the only green flag, like an omelet in three minutes. It feels like the future. Nothing to clean up. 
Allison, I'm going to send in our Slack a recipe for a vegan omelet. Oh, okay. Uh, it uses chickpea flour. Oh, okay. Uh, it's really, really good. It's like what what Aaron and I like do basically every weekend. Oh, excellent. Um, That'd be awesome. I mean, it's also as good, as good as the stuff that you put inside of it, which can be whatever you want. Yeah. Um, we usually do, like I usually do like a tofu scramble and I just shove whatever leftover stuff we might have sitting in the fridge into the into this tofu scramble and then like spice it and then put it in the omelet that's why i like like omelets are great because it is a choose your own adventure so if you have the vehicle then like the the other stuff can just happen Uh, omelet that that's my that's my that's my uh my my throw everything into a, a a dish breakfast the throw everything into a single dish dinner is poutine like, oh my God. like you just make the fries and you just shove whatever you happen to have left over on top of it and you eat it with the fries. It's cool. It's fine. We, we try probably not we'll technically have, poutine. We'll have poutine for dinner and then we'll, I'll, I'll make a smoothie like to accompany it like that somehow, oh. <laughs> somehow like you got to have something that's like fresh and then you have something mm-hmm. that's just like. Yeah, def- so, definitely does the offset. Uh-huh. Um, so that's okay. It's, it's like it's like it's like carbon neutral eating yeah yeah I'm just calorie like, calorie neutral like if i have this thing over here then that will offset the ridiculous amount of calories i'm having with this thing yeah equal temperament <laughs> equal, equal temperament exactly Ta-da! maybe you can make poutine this weekend gary that's a option i should do i should yeah yeah that is an option I have any fries. Mushroom gravy, cheese curds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> I would put a hurt on that. Tyler would put a hurt on that. Katie would be like, eh. Really? By the way, who was, was it Charlotte that was in that photo you posted with the astronaut helmet? Yes. He's so yes. tall. I was like, who's that yes. kid? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's Charlotte. She is tall and um, her opinions match her height. <laughs> She's uh she's something. She is uh like the the nice thing about being in somewhat like rural area is the animals. Um and I mean like we spend a lot of time watching the uh, two pairs of cardinals that are around here and the squirrels and all the other birds and some robins. It's interesting it's how how uh <clears throat> Like we moved literally a block away and there are so many more animals that we see at this house than we did at the other house. Oh. Like, wow. like a lot. Um, we like, we, we've had deer come into the backyard. We've seen, uh, we've had deer come up to the front porch actually. Um, and we've seen them before at the other place, but like much further from this, these are like things that are coming right up to us. Um, we get uh, migrating Orioles, although we got those at the other place, uh, but we've seen like a bunch of different species of birds that we've never saw. We see a lot more lizards, like it's just a lot of, it's really interesting. interesting. Yeah, we, we get, uh, we get uh, house centipedes uh, here, but we didn't get them there. And literally again, a block, not even a long block, a short like block. <laughs> You're like, it's not even a city block. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a residential when, block. When we first moved in here, um, Katie famously, there was an, uh, like a millipede, centipede, something crawling across the floor uh, that was new to us, you know? And she's like, dad, get it. There's a peed of some sort here. <laughs> some sort. All I know is I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how's centipede well, and to Charlotte, looking? To Charlotte, every bug is a spider. But she pronounces it fighter. So that's fun. Plus two to strength for a fighter. Okay. Oh, got it. Uh, is this the part where I explain what equal temperament is? <laughs> yes. This is the part. Uh, it is It is a musical term. And it is the definition. Yeah, we didn't yes. go down. I was that. concerned. I'm like, darn we didn't it. Go oh. down. <laughs> we didn't explore that avenue. I was thinking about it. So, okay. So what, did, what was it? It approximates just intervals uh, in dividing an octave. So in Western music, right, an octave is 12 tones. Uh, if you look at a piano, a piano uses equal temperament so that if you play in the key of C, 
right? It's 12 equivalent tones going up, you play in the key of D, et cetera. Um, and the problem with it is um, that mathematically, uh, like when you listen to music and you actually look at like the root and, and figure out overtones, uh, it's, it actually doesn't, doesn't work. So when pianos like in before equal temperament was the way that you would tune fixed tuning instruments like pianos, guitars, et cetera, um, you would have a piano that's tuned for C. And so if you, you would have all the keys available, but if you, but if the song was actually in the key of D, you would find that when you hit those alternate chords, that if you were playing with an open tune instrument, wind or unfretted strings, it was very gross sounding because musicians were playing the overtones that sound correct orally. Um, but the fixed instrument tuning was wrong. Um, and so before equal temperament, music was um, much more difficult. Um, the, the open tuning that like professional musicians use as they're playing uh, singers, whatever, uh, is called just intonation. Um, and you can calculate, in some cases, there's as much as a, uh, a two Hertz difference uh, in just intonation versus equal temperament tuning, uh, which is significant. If you play them next to each other, you go, wow, that's gross. But we're so uh, ingrained in equal temperament, which is also why uh, many times Eastern music doesn't sit right with Western ears, is that the Western ear is so, so accustomed to equal temperament coming out of the instrumentation we have that um, kinds of music that, that don't have that same concept, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't sit right, even regardless of whether or not you're you're in a 12 tone or 19 tone or 32 tone octave, whatever the case may be. Uh, anyway, equal temperament. And there's some great articles on here. Oh, there was one more thing I want to read about it. Hold on. Yeah, I uh, there's a there was a conductor that uh, didn't ask me anything on Reddit like three years ago, um, and was talking about how to how to like practice intonation. Uh, and I found this part was fa fascinating. Was like uh, this conductor suggested like starting just play a drone note. And so linked to a Spotify playlist of drone notes on a cello, like six minutes C. So I listened to six minutes, just the note C on a cello and like hummed in my head. Um, and um, he said like, if you play the fifth and listen, um, you can make the fifth sound really good. But if you put the tuner up on the note that you're playing, the tuner will tell you that you're a little bit sharp. Um, because equal temperament has the tuner mathematically looking at what the, where the note should be across an A440 12 tone equal temperament scale versus what you're hearing and what you're playing. Uh, and then the same holds true on a third that um, you're very flat on a third if you listen to the tuner, but you're not really. Uh, so, and then I found this all fascinating because like one of these concepts I've been playing with in my head, I, this is the longest damn explanation ever, sorry. <laughs> one of the concepts I've been playing with in my head is like, with music, one of the things that that's powerful about music is it's it is just actually math, right? Like we hear a note and then we hear the overtones and we hear chords and and the dissonance that's created by overlapping waveforms that don't only every once in a while cross exactly, and that's where that pulsing comes from and whatever. Um, so to like understand that actually like applying that math is all based on equal temperament only and not on just intonation um, is uh, is like it kind of broke the. I was only even looking at 50% of the story trying to understand what was happening musically, mathematically, uh, and could only ever comprehend 50% using that method. So uh, super fascinating. Uh, oh, one more thing, <laughs> one more final thing, final thing. Um, if you look at like some notes that, that can be sung and you look at like the height of waveforms, um, the human ear is just bafflingly cool. Like our ear canals are, are small, um, and often some of the tones we can make out if you were to actually draw the waveform are as large as 12 feet. Like a human voice can sing a tone that if you could draw the wave, it would be 12 feet peak to peak. And we can pick out that tone based on like a tiny little piece of that wave and identify what it is. Uh, so fucking weird. You can. Some well, no, might... I mean, you could hear a note and be, I mean, if it's a 12 feet or 11 feet or 13 yeah, feet, no, like you could say that's a low note. Yeah. It's not yeah. a high note. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The low, the low end of the spectrum is not the end of the spectrum that I have problems with. So, 
equal temperament. I, I will share, I'm just going to drop a bunch of links in now. Uh, one yeah. of them is from a site called healingsounds.com. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved this. Uh, and it, it digs into the Western versus Eastern. And if you're used to equal temperament, like, can you actually have healing sounds? Um, because you're not hitting the correct overtones. Uh, and the answer, the short answer is, yeah, why not? We don't wow. have any questions. Much information. I have a lot yeah. to process. Yeah. I'm dropping links in now before I forget. Because that would be like me, would be to uh, to not drop in links. Not do the thing that you said you were going to do. Like uh, <laughs> like the, the photographic tour of all of your uh, uh, chandeliers. <laughs> yeah. I think that I linked to the Reddit answer where he, where the, I'm assuming it's a he, it looks like a dude in the picture, um, uh, talks about, um, in it, like, like playing with, uh, well, like practicing your intonation. So also it helps understand why sometimes when I'm on my guitar, I'm not happy with the sound, even though I just tuned the damn thing. Well, yeah, cause I tuned it. And now I'm playing a bizarre chord and I'm, I'm hearing that, that not fit. I should tune differently. I should cheat the strings that I know I'm going to be off on. Is that your whole world topsy-turvy? Yeah, it kind of, it kind of lessens the, I've never really been like one, like before I start playing, like I pull up a tuner to make sure the guitar's in tune. Like I play a chord and go, yeah, that's close enough. And I play like four or five chords and say, that's close enough. But if it's not close enough, then I do use the tuner. And honestly, what I should do is like get the root in tune, an E or maybe not an E. I should pick somewhere randomly and get that low string in tune and then work up from there and be like, now it's in tune with itself. And that's enough. That's enough. Maybe I don't need to get it in tune to anything. Maybe in tune with itself is enough. Yes. If you are in tune with yourself, um, you'll be happy. You'll be happy. Yeah. I, 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 Tuners are nice, but uh, that's so different from from the way that I always tuned and always was involved in, in tuning stringed instruments uh, when I was in high school and in bands and stuff. Like, we don't use tuners. You, like, find a note, whatever the note is, and then everybody tunes to themselves and each other, and, and then that's yeah, it's punk rock. Well, that's just <laughs> intonation right there. Like if you're tuning to yourselves, like that's, that's just intonation. And part of what led me down this is I was looking at a weird old instrument that predated the tuba. Um, yes, one does. Right, that was the previous topic. And so I was looking at this thing and I'm going, like I heard some sound samples and I'm like, wow, that thing doesn't have like a very strong center of tone. And then I was wondering, someone once said it like once upon a time that we hear classical music these days with like, you know, world-class musicians. But realistically, when Beethoven was, well, maybe not Beethoven, but lesser known composers were writing stuff, like their local group would play it. And there might be some like, you know, guy that, you know, shoes horses for a living and is like on the clarinet and it's just mediocre at best. So what we hear is so thoughtful and in tune. In reality, it was like, eh, it was your, your average like middle school or high school band playing it. So there were some problems. Um, and, and so that's what led me down to this, like, how did they even tune back in the day? And what did that sound like? And the answer is maybe not as pleasant as we hear it today. Um, so, wow. There you have it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at @binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.